a choice that she made to trust him. God has always been working. He's always up to something good. This morning I want to say what scripture reveals. We're going to go in a bit deeper on the prevalence of God working in our lives, not only in the forefront as we see over here all the amazing things, but even just as I'm standing here, I'm reminded of God is, how God is working in the background. Most of you don't know this, but there are 10, 20 people running around at the back while we are all experiencing church to make this happen. I want to honor you guys as well. You guys are amazing. But that's what God does. That's how he works. We don't always see he's working, but he's busy. Jesus himself understood this concept of God always busy, always working. In fact, he lived his life accordingly. And we read in John 5, verse 16 to 17, and this is where just after... Now God has always been working and Jesus explains this and he tells them that now even he's continuing the work of the Father. Now and even now this morning as we've experienced the work is still continuing through his Holy Spirit which is here in this place. Now what Jesus did that day was practically his death sentence but he knew what he had to do and he knew the work had to be done. He knew the mandate and the work had to be finished. See, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word, and I'm not going to throw a bunch of Hebrew and, and, and um, Greek scriptures on today because I haven't, um, I haven't stood here for a long time and usually a lot of people, they like to throw those definitions. But this is profound. That word actually means the working. do business. In other words, it's the opposite of laziness, the opposite of complacency, the opposite of, what do you call it, idleness or inactivity. God is always busy. He has always been since the beginning. Still is. He's always up to something good. And I put it in a few point forms. And my first point that I actually want to touch on today is how it starts, how God actually, in the beginning, he, he dictated our seasons that we are in. He dictates the seasons. And this is evident since the beginning of and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now creation in itself was profound, yes. But I am so, so touched by the fact that Jesus, even in the day that he created rest, he was busy up to something good. Even in the day he himself set aside to rest, he sanctified the day. He knew exactly what he was doing, putting into place what was needed for us so that we could give him glory one day. Now that word sanctified actually means to causatively make or pronounce something clean. To consecrate, to prepare, to make holy, shown to be sacred. In other words, taking something, changing it, making it into something else, presenting it as something of much more worth and value. Something only God can do. That is the exact same word that is used in Jeremiah, where God speaks to Jeremiah in 1 verse 4 to 5. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Just how beautiful does Scripture tie in how God is working. Not only did God know us before we were born, no, He set us aside made us holy, set us apart for something specific. 
You see, what he puts into place stays into place. And it will come to fruition in our lives. His plan, amen. His plans are not, God's plans not only withstand the test of time. They don't only withstand the test of time. No, they actually transcend the very concept of time. Because he is God. He dictates the seasons. In Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, we read, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are, your way, are my ways your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, we as human beings, we simply cannot fathom the extent of God's perfect, meticulous planning. We cannot fathom his wisdom, his infinite power, the, the precision at which he works. It's something that we just won't understand. And the Apostle Paul actually describes this working of his wisdom and power in 1 Corinthians verse 25, where he says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, Paul's not saying God is foolish or wise. No, he's just simply stating it and putting it into a package that we as man might understand just how vast and how much more next level God is in comparison to us. You see, God has seen the full picture in our lives. He knows all and he sees all. His ways are not our ways. His ways are much higher. Now, as we progress, I, I'm so evident of God not only dictating the seasons, but God is also dictating us, man. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, if we look back at that first scripture in John 5, verse 17, it says, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now. And I have been working. God revealed himself completely and fully to his son. He bestowed all authority onto him. And the scripture therefore encourages us that by honoring the son, we are honoring the father. Honoring the continuous work that is being done. Jesus spoke to the disciples in John 4. And this is where they offered him food because they thought he was hungry. And in typical Jesus fashion, he laid a statement on them that they needed to chew on. That you can't just digest. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That is such a powerful sentence. My food is to do the will of him who sent me, the father. My food is to do the will of the father and to finish his work. That is what sustains him. That is what gives his body nourishment. That is what keeps him alive. Is to do the will of the father and to finish it. Jesus himself, he was part of God's perfect plan for humanity and continuing his work and bringing it into completion. Now God revealed his truth through his son Jesus, giving us clear instructions for this life on earth, but more than that, simultaneously um, displaying his love for us and giving us this great hope and assurance that he is busy working through the son. Not only does he dictate the seasons, but he dictates his person. Through the sun, and he's always busy. In the circumstances that we face every day, and, and as we are sitting here, if we just quiet down for a moment, you'll hear the generator. Okay. So, we are all in different circumstances, and I don't have to go too much into detail, but the, even the circumstances that we face in our lives, God is busy. You see, knowing that the sun was continuing the good and perfect work of the Father. It affirms God's plan for us, but simultaneously it provides insight for us how we can faithfully hold on to this plan, not to waver. Because, and I'm just going to take a sip of water quick. Sometimes we, sometimes we, it's so easy, we just say, Jesus, take the wheel. We know that statement. In our circumstances, it's not going lacquer. Jesus, take the wheel. Go like that but I'm just going to keep my hand on the gear lever. Or we say, Jesus, take the wheel. You take me where you want to go, God. I will follow, but I'm just going to put my right foot there on the brakes. You see, it's so easy for us as man to say, Jesus, take the wheel. We believe in our heart. We are allowing him to control our circumstances. But at the same time, we are dictating the pace. We are saying, let's go hard, Lord, but let's not go hard too fast. It's so easy for us as men to do this. And 
And as I was preparing, I was reminded of this. I don't want to go into too much detail about myself, my previous life, but before I was in ministry, I was in, in sales, in vehicle sales for 11, almost 11 years. And there was this one day that I will never forget. I was working in Stellenbosch, and there was this renowned doctor, a very famous guy in the town, and he was interested in buying a new Toyota Fortuner. Okay. So he made an appointment with me, and we only had an automatic transmission Toyota Fortuner. Who of you drive an automatic car here? It's young people as well. I also have one. Okay. So automatic cars are nice to drive. Okay. If you, if you drive them, you'll know you don't have to do much. Your left foot can pretty much relax. Now, it was evident as this guy got into the car, smart guy, um, very famous guy. It was very evident he had no clue how to drive an automatic vehicle. So he drove it as he would a normal car with his left and his right foot. Right foot on the, on the accelerator, left foot on the brakes. And the brake, for those of you that don't know, on a, I see some people have experienced this. Um, for those of you that don't know, the brakes are really sensitive on automatic car. That's why you just use your right foot. So we were driving like this the whole time. We couldn't even get off the sidewalk. And the more I humbly tried to help him and say, in a nice, politely fashion, how, how we can, can do it, the more a prideful heart prevented me from helping this guy. And he just com- continued to say, there's something wrong with this car. There's something wrong with this car. Needless to say, I didn't make the sale that day. But it just reminded me of so many times, sometimes, how we, we throw our own spanners in the works, not allowing God to work in this situation. And Jesus actually gives us this amazing scripture in Matthew 6. And it's a famous one, we know it. But I just want to highlight some truths from it today. And it's in Matthew 6 from verse 25 to 31 where it says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is life not more than food and the body not more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add a cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore... Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. But your heavenly Father knows what you need. He knows you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom and his, of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We know this scripture. It's a meaty scripture. There's a lot of truths in. I know the scripture, in fact, so well. I, it's written on a board right next to my desk there in the office. And sometimes the scripture answers every circumstance of life. It's great just to refer back to that. But I'm just going to highlight a few truths. Now, Jesus here is not only affirming our value in God's eyes as we read the scripture, But he's also establishing God's power and authority in our lives by being the one providing for us, knowing what we need before we even ourselves know that. He has given us the keys to his kingdom and by seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, not worrying about the day of tomorrow, we can faithfully live in this present moment, trusting in his fullness, trusting in the seen but also in the unseen. Because God's got this. We can hold on to his word. Now this image up here that I want to put up, it's a picture of a roller coaster. And there are clearly two different types of people on that picture. And I want to encourage you, there's actually, it's a cute little video that you can go watch on YouTube. Um, It's only just over a minute. Um, You can look for this, you will find it. It's just something, couple on roller coaster or advert, roller coaster advert. Any case. Clearly, when we look at this picture, there are two different mindsets there. Let's just forget that lady in the middle there. I didn't Photoshop her out. Um, So 
as we started this journey today, this message, we spoke about this roller coaster. And in many ways, life represents a roller coaster. And we can all agree about that. Um, it's got its ups and downs. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's scary. That analogy can go far and wide. We can go on and on about it. But I just want to take these two people. Many times in our life, if we call life the roller coaster, we resonate with the guy on the right. Always focusing on the things around us that can go wrong. Always focus, focusing on the problems, focusing on the things that we do not have control over. Always seeing the worst, missing out on the experience. You see, sometimes we can even say that being like that guy, we conform to this world. These negative things, they start molding us into something that changes our behaviors, our thoughts, the way that we act. Molding us into something as Jesus described in Matthew 6, the previous scripture, you don't have to put it up, where he says, oh, you of little faith. Or we can relate to the lady on the left. Very much aware of a situation, but very much present in the moment and the experience. Optimistic, hopeful. We have a hopeful assurance in what God did for us through His Son. We hold on to His plans and His needs. He provides our needs. He knows our needs. There is a perfect plan. There is a perfect outcome. Sometimes you just have to trust. Sometimes you just have to even let go. See, if we continue looking at life and, and just how God is busy working in us, He's not just the one that dictated the seasons or man through His Son or even the one that dictates our circumstances, but I'm so aware of God also the, being the one that's dictating our calling, our purpose. We spoke about it in the beginning. Each person here today is here for a reason. We have a purpose. You see, when Moses encountered God at that burning bush, I think beforehand he was more like the lady on the left of that picture. And Moses contemplated and questioned his calling to God. That scripture in Exodus 3 verse 10 tells us where Moses said, uh, God says, come now, therefore I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And that I should bring the children out of Israel. Who am I? I'm no one special. God says to him, I will certainly be with you. And I'm going to jump to verse 14. And it says, God said to Moses, this is who he must say to the people who he is. I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am sent you. I'm sure by the end of Moses' life and his journey, he could probably resonate more with the gentleman on the right. He's been through all those ups and downs, but he saw God's hand, he saw God's provision. You see, the great I am, the God of his fathers, that scripture says where God speaks to Moses, he says, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God is in control. He knows the outcome. You see, God saw your exodus. He saw you moving through your your sea. He saw you moving through your desert. Some of us are still in those places. He sees you. He provides for us in that desert. He goes by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. He knows. He's always busy. He's always working in our callings. You see, Paul speaks of this calling in Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not by yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our creation was not a mistake. God does not make mistake. Each and every one of us here, we're made with a purpose. We have a calling. There is a higher purpose for us. And God's workmanship, that word workmanship actually refers to um, a produced by a skilled artisan. In other words, God was a master designer when he made you. The best of the best. And God is still at work in your calling. 
In Hebrews he writes, and Hebrews written to a persecuted nation, converted to Christianity, um, facing trials of many kinds. This is a book written to a nation that was facing various, various challenges. Because they were pursuing their calling, they were following Jesus. And he says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so, so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. For with the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand throne of God. We are encouraged we are encouraged by the scripture that we are surrounded by the working, the faith testimonies of these fathers of faith in our lives. And that we should in likewise manner hold on to what God is doing. We will overcome our adversities as they have done. By placing our focus and attention onto Jesus. Not allowing the things of this world to distract us and to take our focus off our purpose and our calling. We listen to that generator again. Let's not be distracted by, by things or stages in our lives. Stages is a very sensitive word these days to use. Let's not be distracted by the stages of our life. You can see, you can see stage four as being without, power for, <laughs> being without power for a long time. Or you can see it as now I have time to read a, a good book. Now I have time to, to speak more to my children. Now I have time to go play outside more with my kids. Now I have time to pick up this new hobby. By changing the way we think, by focusing on the one that is in control, our mindsets are going to start changing and we're going to be present and see his working in us. Amen. I want to ask the band to come up. I have to wrap up. I want us all just to close our eyes for a few moments. I'm going to read a psalm, Psalm 139, just as the band ministers to us. And this is such a beautiful, summative explanation of God at work in our lives. And as I read this, it's not going to be on the screen, so that's why I want you to close your eyes. Let's tune in. Let's tune out the, the noise of this world. Let's tune in to what God wants to say to us. And let's allow this word to speak to us, to speak to our hearts. Just as David this, did this, read this psalm, he understood something of God because his life was a roller coaster just like ours. He faced many things, yet he knew the one who was above all things, the one who has seen all things. Psalm 139 You have searched me Lord and you know me you know when I sit and when I rise you perceive my thoughts from afar you discern my going and my lying down you are familiar with all my ways before a word is on my tongue you Lord know it completely you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me such knowledge is too wonderful for me too lofty for me to attain where can I go from your spirit where can I flee from your presence if I go up to the heavens you are there if I make my bed in the depths of the earth you are there if I rise on the wings of the dawn if I settle on the far side of the sea even there your hand will guide me your right hand will hold me fast if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like they, day, for darkness is light to you, Lord. You created my inmost beings. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, 
they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. While we're in this place of just drawing near to the Lord, let's keep our focus on Him. Let's keep our eyes closed. As I said today, I believe there's a purpose for each person here today. And God is busy. God is working in your life. To each person sitting in this hall today, you are not here by chance. God knew what He was doing when He made you. God knew you had to be here today. God is doing more in your life today than you will ever see, think, or imagine. And not only is God in every situation, but He is the one that gets the glory in the end. So I just want to pray, Father, today we give you the glory for your working in our lives, Lord. Father, we thank you that you are always busy, constantly sorting something out. Sometimes we, we look for you in the, in the front, Lord, but you are actually working in the background. And I pray today, Lord, that you will help us to trust you in those situations, to know that you are busy, to know that you have a plan set in motion, and that plan will come to completion in our lives. Father, I pray for each person here today in this place that you will just come and instill this, this peace in them knowing that there is a plan. This assurance, knowing that you are the God that has gone before. Help us, Lord, to make peace with the fact that we do not know everything, but that we can take you at your word because you do. You have gone before us. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. Amen. If there's anyone that still wants to pray afterwards, there's a little time you can come to the front. We are formally dismissed. Thank you for coming today. Um, I pray that God will just continue to move in each and every one of you as you leave this place. Amen.